Hello everybody and Namaste. We are continuing in this session with the Tripura Rasya, the amazing conversation between Lord Tatreya, the teacher of teachers, and his student Parshurama, the great warrior. A warrior who fights the evil within or the samskaras and attains victory over these. In our last session, we left off at verse 70-71 and that was from chapter 18 and we will continue now with verse verses 72. Just a short recap, we left off talking about the dream state. The dream state and the cause of the dream state, the dream itself, does not exist apart from the mind. It is a part of the mind. And so it is imagination. Just as human beings do not have horns, rabbits also do not have horns. So this text often refers to this fact that rabbits do not have horns is purely imagination. And so also in a dream, the dream objects are absolutely imaginary. Verse 72, chapter 18. Lord Dattatraya says, O son of Bhrigu, listen. Your consciousness is all pervading in itself. Therefore, it cannot be compared with the void because it is self-illuminated. Apart from this, there is no difference. Like the void, the self is perfect, subtle, pure, unborn, infinite, formless, the source of all, uncontaminated, eminent and transcendent. The void does not have these qualities. In reality, pure consciousness is called the real self. Among all these, the self alone exists. The pure self is called Atman. Because consciousness pervades all, there is no difference between the void and the self. That which is the void is called Atman and that which is Atman is called the void. There is a school of thought called Shunyavada and later they came to be known as Buddhists. This is Buddhism. Before this concept of Buddhism was formed, there existed the school of Shunyavada. The concept or idea of a religion called Buddhism existed is a, is a new phenomenon. Buddha, Gautam Buddha, was born into and grew up into the Hindu spiritual landscape, which includes other streams of philosophy such as Jainism and all these come out from the same source and there were different schools of thought and so we see that in earlier times there were different schools they were called Shunyavad or Pranavad it's a school of Prana so they were referred to as with the main concept and in the school of Shunyavada later grew so big and dominant because of the great emperor Ashoka who became a follower of Gautam Buddha and his teachings and he promoted it with all his great wealth that it became independent of 
the rest of the spiritual streams within the Indian subcontinent and emerged to be standing apart from from these it rejected also the Vedas and the knowledge therein and so became an independent religion and has grown to be known as Buddhism. In Buddhism one speaks of void that there is nothing, it's a void and this is the major difference and they deny the self and this text finds a bridge between that concept and consciousness by saying there's actually no difference between the self and the void. What they call the void is in fact the self. Coming back to verse 75. Because consciousness pervades all, there is no difference between the self and the void. That which is the void is called Atman, and that which is Atman is called the void. Out of delusion, the ignorant conceive of Atman in the form of space in the same way, and owl perceives sunlight in the form of darkness. The wise man sees the void as that self-illuminated consciousness. Supreme power exists beyond the phenomenal world, yet manifests itself in many forms. Through her power, O Parshurama, she assumes many forms. She appears in many ways, but this is because of the distortion of the mind. Actually, she is pure consciousness, self-existent reality. As the magician, by his skill, creates many forms, yet remains all alone, Similarly, pure consciousness is free from all impurities. By the way of Maya, she seems to be many, though she is only one pure consciousness beyond all comprehension. Her veiling power confuses those who have limited knowledge, just like a magician confuses his audience. A beautiful image here of the magician as the magician creates illusions to fool us, to confuse us, so also she, that is the Great Mother, Divine Mother, Tripura, creates this illusion and we believe that there are many, many forms. Just look around you. You will see many forms. You will see your tables, chairs, sofas. If you look out of the window, you see houses, cars, trees, animals perhaps. All these different forms, beings, are all created by the divine power, the Shakti of Tripura. So she appears in these many ways. In reality, she is the one pure consciousness. Maya is unknowable. We see that yogis and others with the power of mantra perform miracles with their limited powers, but nothing is impossible for the highest consciousness. In the world, we see that the magicians with their skills perform many wonders. Therefore, it is not difficult for absolute consciousness. So we see that a magician who has such limited power can create such illusions. So can you imagine, with the unlimited power of pure consciousness, we can actually create unlimited illusions or wonders in the world. So those who have greater access to consciousness have greater powers or siddhis. So there are yogis who have certain powers 
due to the practice of mantra, but these are still limited powers. If you attain the highest consciousness, self-realization, there are no more limits. Verse 86 O Parshurama, Supreme Consciousness, through her pure power of sovereignty, allows herself to appear in many forms. Egoism is the cause of separateness and is called avidya. Buddhi is limited and is also avidya. By not contemplating on the real self and by, by being dissipated in the external world, many logicians and learned pundits get diluted. So this is an important verse. Here it says that your self has a power of sovereignty, to be sovereign, to be a ruler, to be independent, to have these powers, you can decide what you want to do. So, pure consciousness allows herself to appear in different forms. She is not made to take different forms. She allows herself to take different forms. It's, out of, it's, a, it's a play. Egoism, on the other hand, is the cause of separateness. Limitation. It's not unlimited and powerful like pure consciousness. And this egoism is the cause also of our suffering. Buddhi is also limited and is also ignorance. This may come as a surprise to some of you. We have often said buddhi is that finest part in you, the most sattvic aspect of you, and you need to listen to the guiding voice of buddhi, the voice of wisdom within. That is true. Yet buddhi is not beyond the mind. Buddhi is part of the mind. Anything that's a part of the mind is part of the duality remains ignorance. You attain knowledge only on attaining that which is beyond duality, on attaining the non-dual state of pure consciousness. By not contemplating on the real self and by being dissipated in the external world, Many logicians and learned pundits get deluded. Verse 88 is a very interesting observation made perhaps a few thousand years ago. Is true even today that there are many who, based on logic and learning, discuss scriptures, discuss spirituality, discuss all these matters of wisdom without really having attained wisdom, without having any kind of direct experience. They remain focused and dissipate all their energies in the external world. They do not have direct experience of their inner selves and that of your consciousness. Yet they spend their time in shallow empty, meaningless discussions. Verse 89 Unless someone makes practical application of his guru's teachings about reality and unreality and employs them for self-realization, Merely listening to instructions cannot bring the fruit of liberation. Therefore, Parshurama, experience everything I have taught you so far through your inward and one-pointed mind. So this is very clear here. It says you need to have direct experience. It is not enough to have intellectual knowledge, book knowledge. 
employ all the practical teachings to attain self-realizations. And only this will bring about liberation. Merely listening to instructions cannot bring about liberation. So he says, Use your inward and one-pointed mind. Very important to understand. Inward, because if your energies are dissipated in the external world, you are not going to learn about the inner reality. And second part is the one-pointed mind. You can be inward, but you can be still dissipated. If your mind is not focused on any one thing, it is jumping all over the place, has many internal conflicts within the mind itself that are disturbing you, it is not possible to focus in a one-pointed manner and attain liberation. Verse 91 Remove the different forms of the world and be aware of the underlying unity in diversity. That supreme power is self-illuminated because it is free from illusions. So the only way to attain liberation, become aware of the unity and diversity, is to remove the different forms of the world. How do you remove these different forms? You need to remove the illusion of these different forms. And be free from these illusions. And that is only possible with pure consciousness by attaining that. Verse 92 says, Therefore she is creator of the pause. The pause itself is yet beyond all. All insentient objects rest in her and their existence depends on the self-existent Atman. So, self Self-realization or getting to have a direct experience of self-realization is possible, perhaps, let's put this way, not the whole blown thing, not the full blown version of it, possible for you and for everybody who's listening. It doesn't mean that you may attain Kaivalya, that you remain established in the self as a Jivan Mukt. But it may happen that you are able to get just a short glimpse, this pause, this pause of the illusions, the pause of the breath, this pause will bring you in touch with that direct reality. These objects have no power to illuminate themselves. They are not self-existent. The self-existent consciousness does not depend on any external power for illumination. It is the highest of all and is not found in insentient objects. Therefore, self-conscious reality is free from diversities and remains untouched by limitation. It is not like the objects in the mirror. So the Tripura Rahasya comes back to this point that objects have no power to illuminate themselves. If you want to, if you enter a dark room, you need to switch on the light to illuminate the objects in that room. But if you yourself are in a dark room, you know you exist because you're a sentient being. We have the sun and the moon. These are sources of light. But what are the sources of light that illuminate the sun itself? You know the sun exists. You see it. 
And even if you don't see it, it's behind the clouds. You still know it exists. Even when it's nightfall, you know that somewhere in the world, the sun exists. <clears throat> it is shining. We know that. And this knowing, this is that which illuminates. This is the knower and has the power to illuminate. And it doesn't depend on any external source for illumination. So you can be sitting in a dark room or in a dark cave somewhere. And maybe it's so dark you can't even see the hand in front of your face. But you know it is there. You know that you are there. You exist. And that is because you are a sentient being. And the self-existent consciousness in you does not need any other confirmation. And this self-conscious reality is unlimited. If only we could be established in it. But we are not. We identify with our limited egoism with ahankara and this is why we have limited ourselves verse 96 o parshurama such an all pervading consciousness cannot be divided because it is self-existent reality. The same consciousness is called all-pervading, one absolute reality. For the sake of discussion, this self-existent reality seems to have a dual existence, although it is one all-pervading reality. As light and warmth are inseparable from fire, similarly the absolute reality is inseparable from blissful joy. This is called Maya Shakti, which can make the impossible possible. It is like a mirror that is crystal clear, yet contains images. As you know, you have seen a mirror which is really clear but of course it's reflecting many images. In fact, the clearer the mirror, the more images it reflects, the better it reflects. And this is Maya Shakti. It makes the impossible possible. All sorts of amazing images, forms, all surrounding us all the time. We are so lost in our day-to-day -day activities. We have no time to just stop, to pause and be amazed at this beauty. Verse 102 The appearance of limitation is the appearance of the non-self. This is called avidya. Ignorance. It is Jada Shakti, unconscious power, Shunya, void, and Prakriti, the primordial nature. The first stage of limitation is called non existence, void, austerity, darkness, or the beginning of creation. The appearance of the void is due to ignorance. The sphere of Atman is free from egoism. That state is also called void. Egoism is the cause of samskara of the world. That which the ignorant think is the void actually gives birth to the various forms of the world. O Parshurama, think with clarity of mind. That which you consider the void is actually the ovum for all living creatures, the void seen in the body of others is actually the self-existent Atman.
Now this may seem a bit confusing and I will try to make this a little bit more clear. When you sleep at night, lie down in your bed, close your eyes, the world around you, your bedroom, maybe the cupboards, the, 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 the photo frames on the wall, the lights, all seem to disappear. You close your eyes and you fall into your dreams. It's another world. You play out many things in these dreams and then you recede further into deep dreamless sleep. What is there? Most of us have no recollection of this deep dreamless sleep. If you ask yourself, who is there? Who is there in deep dreamless sleep? Somebody is watching the waking state, watching the room, the lights and everything around you. In the dreams, somebody was watching the dreams. Similarly, in deep dreamless state, somebody is watching the dreamless state, this darkness, this void. The one who is watching this void is pure consciousness. If you would succeed in being fully aware in that state of deep dreamless state, in that void, then you would be momentarily established in the Atman, in pure consciousness. And there is no egoism there. And so the state is called the void, deep dreamless state, and it is also the ovum or the egg which, is, which gives birth to the whole universe around. Because from there, slowly, the dreams evolve. And from the dreams, the world evolves as you come into the world. And egoism is the cause of the world. That was a little bit clearer that in the state of deep dreamless sleep we also experience jada shakti jada the word jada means gross heavy and it's not light it's not subtle it's jada and that's also the unconscious aspect so we always have two parts of ourselves conscious and unconscious so one is conscious, is subtle, it's fine, it's, it's awake. The other one is jada, is asleep, is unconscious. And this is also known as tamas or darkness. Because in this deep dreamless state, most of the times you're not aware. So it is heavy, it is a dark state of jada shakti. It is only when you are able to retain your awareness in that state are you able to really understand what the Tripura Rahasya is saying here. That which the ignorant think is the void actually gives birth to the various forms of the world. O Parshurama, think with clarity of mind. That which you consider the void is actually the ovum of all living creatures. The void seen in the body of others is a self-existent Atman. So if it is seen with awareness, it is Atman. But what is, because that is the one who is seeing, 
But if you're not seeing, what is it that you're not seeing? You're seeing, not seeing the darkness and that is the void. So it seems that Atman is like a pearl in the shell of the void or this deep dreamless state. Verse 109 The veil of ignorance has its predominance and that is considered to be the mind. The center of my of consciousness is called the individual soul, also known as Atman. Thus, the same Atman, the universal self, which is Paramatman, or consciousness, appears as the void, and then becomes the five elements, earth, water, fire, air and space. Space or void is very subtle and clear, but because of the qualities of tamas, the five elements are seen in it. This way, covered by the body, it becomes the individual soul and illuminates within, like a candle kept in a jar, illuminates the jar. As the light is seen through the holes of the jar, similarly the light of Atman emanates through the senses. So we see that the soul of Atman is in this jar, the body, is covered by the body and that's the jar. So this individual soul is also Jivatman, is all the stuff, the body plus the pure soul, pure consciousness which is Atman combined together. Is the jar. So you are a jar. <laughs> and you can see this light through sometimes shining through you just as the light would shine through the holes in a jar. In India, there is a beautiful festival that is celebrated generally around the time of September and October. It is the festival of the Divine Mother and it is celebrated for nine nights. Navratri it's called and then the last day the tenth day is called the Sera. During this time different parts of the country the goddess is celebrated, worshipped and in the western part of the country in the state of Gujarat every night people dance around a pot which has got a candle in it. Well, that's at least the tradition, done traditionally. It is probably, or mostly, not done like this anymore in modern times. But um, for those who celebrate the dance, which is called Garba in the more traditional manner, they put in the center a earthen pot, which has got beautiful designed holes in it and they light a lamp in it and they dance at night so you can see the light glowing through this beautifully decorated pot and the symbol of this is exactly what has been described here this is a jar or a pot and the light shines through and Generally the women, but also the men, dance around this pot in the Garba and it's a symbol of a circle, a chakra, a circle around the center being pure consciousness. It's very symbolic, the word Garba, Garbha means womb. It is the womb. Is exactly what we are talking about here. Garba comes from the word means womb. It means that's where all life is born. Everything comes out of that same womb.
verse 115. Consciousness, though all-pervading, is not involved at all in creation, that when its conscious power removes its veil, then one can see it. Because of the light of consciousness, the darkness of the mind is removed. When this light of consciousness really shines through and when you attain it, all the darkness in the mind is removed. So all that was, that which is unconscious in your mind will become conscious. This will be explained a little bit further in the text, just shortly. So I will not go into it right away. But we'll continue reading verse 117. Therefore, O Parshurama, Mind has no separate existence. For all practical purposes, the individual soul assumes the form of the mind. Consciousness, which seems to move, is called mind. That which does not seem to move is called self. So, it says here very clearly, everything is consciousness. When the consciousness is moving, is dynamic, we call it mind. And the consciousness is not dynamic, it's static, it's called the self or Atman. It's put in other words as well. We say Shakti and Shiva. Shakti is when consciousness is dynamic, it's manifesting in different forms. And when it's not manifesting, it is passive, then we say it is Shiva. So also one of the finest texts, Tantra text, says Shiva cannot even move without Shakti. So the great god Shiva is a symbol of that self within you, pure consciousness within you. And of what use is that consciousness? What power does this consciousness have when there is nothing around. Imagine there would be only consciousness then the world would not exist. If the consciousness would not become dynamic and manifest itself, then there would be nothing. We would all be one and then the world would end. There would be no universe. And so this universe exists as a play of Shakti. It gives us an opportunity to live out our desires and samskaras. So the dynamic form is called Shakti and the static form is called Shiva or Atma. Verse 118 O Parshurama removing the veil of ignorance is the nature of consciousness. This veil is called vikalpa, and when that vikalpa does not exist, that knowledge is liberation. O Parshurama, rem renounce this doubt that by removing some kalpa and vikalpa, ignorance can again influence your individual being, because actually there is no veil. The veil is self-imagined. So, in fact, even the veil is imagined doesn't exist, but you have imagined it. So remove these doubts. Verse 121. Suppose someone imagines he has been harassed and tortured by his enemy, and he is constantly nagged. But when he renounces that imagination, his fear also disappears. Then where is the bondage? You can this happens in dreams. We've had all, all of us have had nightmares, terrible dreams where we have been perhaps tortured or we've been chased by our enemies and we're full of fears. But the moment you wake up, you snap out of your dream. Where's the fear gone? Where's the torture? Where's, where's the suffering? It's all gone. It's disappeared because you woke up out of that imagination, that imaginary dream. So also, 
this in a sense is like a dream that you, you it's the way you think that has caused this suffering this ignorance these are thinking patterns habit patterns that you have formed verse 123 o parshurama from the very beginning there is no bondage this insentient delusion should be removed and then you will know what bondage is to believe that one is in bondage is the greatest of bondages it is like a child's self imagined fear if the wise person does not renounce this negative imagination he cannot liberate himself from the bondage of the world and attain moksha so the interesting part about bondage is that to really know what bondage is you have to be free you cannot know what bondage is if you have not tasted freedom imagine somebody would be born in a prison <clears throat> he has never been outside in the world outside he has been given birth to in the prison has lived all his life in the prison so his world is so small he doesn't even know how it exists outside the world he may have heard about it from other other prisoners but he might say ah these prisoners they have their imagination it's not true what they're saying because why haven't i seen it i live here since so long and this is all that exists this is how the world is then when this person this prisoner is set free he gets a shock he gets a shock and what happens to people who have lived in prisons for a very long time there have been cases of those who have been imprisoned for 30 40 years they do not know how to live in the world anymore they come back and the only way they know how to come back is immediately to commit a crime so they immediately brought back and then they're happy because that's all they know and that is of course really very sad but in fact we are in the same situation we think we are free but we are not we are in a prison <laughs> we think this is how everything is because you have not tasted freedom so when you have even a short glimpse of the self a flash very brief fleeting samadhi once you have known it and it's intense enough for you to not forget it and once you have tasted it you will long for it then you know what bondage is because taking the example of the prisoner who was born in the prison he he never went out he didn't know how it was to sleep in comfortable beds he didn't know he thought these beds are always like this hard <laughs> he had never seen a colorful room he thought all rooms are like this dull he had never eaten any f- wonderful food in a fancy restaurant and he thought prison food that's how food is there's nothing else but he went out one time to a wonderful restaurant and then when he came back to the prison after that one meal he thought to himself oh god look at this horrible prison food i have to eat how i long to go back out in the world where there is this amazing place where you get amazing food he goes to a hotel sleeps in such a comfortable bed and he says oh when he sleeps on his hard wooden bed at night oh this is so hard wasn't that wonderful natural soft beautiful sleep that i had and so the longing for freedom begins so it is for you as well if you experience just the short glimpse of prison of freedom from this prison you will long for it all the time the greater and the intenser your experience of your consciousness deeper the longing and then you know really how 
miserable you are in that prison, you know what bondage is. Verse 126 What is this bondage? How can it bind pure consciousness? If the images that are seen in the mirror are able to create bondage, then the appearance of fire in the mirror can also burn. To accept that there is bondage and to believe in bondage is the cause of bondage. There is no bondage otherwise. So a fire which is reflecting in the mirror cannot burn the mirror, right? So in fact, there would be no suffering by that logic because it's merely an illusion. But the fact is, you believe it. You believe it. After a while, all these things that you're stuck in this world and the way it is and you can't get out of that prison, so you believe it and so you're stuck there. If you look at a fire in the mirror and you believe that it's going to burn the mirror, then maybe eventually it will, in some form, damage the mirror, simply because <laughs> the fire grows and burns the mirror eventually. It's not merely a reflection anymore. So it's all about a matter of belief. You believe in a certain thing, you believe in that illusion, like and you believe in the illusion of created by a magician. You believe what you want to believe. To accept that there is bondage and to believe in bondage is the cause of bondage. There is no bondage otherwise, in reality. Verse 129. Unless the Divine Mother, Supreme Consciousness, Universal Consciousness, Tripura, Brahma, Vishnu, Shankara, bless the seeker so that he purifies his inner being, no one can help a seeker attain liberation. In this way, Parshurama renounced this false sense of bondage and self-created existence of the mind and be happy. I would like to say about this, it sounds so fatalistic. No one can help you in liberation. You need to have some divine grace, divine blessings. And I say yes and no to that. You need to do your part. You're not going to get divine grace, Kripa, unless you have done something to deserve it. You need to do your practice. You need to uncolor, you need to long for liberation. And when that longing increases and reaches a point also where you experience the suffering in the world as so terrible, you can't bear it anymore. And you're crying for help, for divine intervention, intercession. Then that divine intervention will come. But that is when you also do your part and you have that deep longing within. If you don't do anything, you're not practicing, you don't do, do anything, it's not going to happen. It's just like those students who don't study and then they keep praying, oh, please, please help me, let me pass my exam, let me do well here, let me get, you know, whatever. And, and you think that you're going to get it? Maybe you get it, maybe that's just happens, this luck. But wouldn't it be much better if you try your best as well as pray <laughs> because there is also the brutal law of karma. The brutal law of karma can be overridden when you please the Divine Mother, Supreme Consciousness, the universal consciousness with your efforts. And they are pleased, then you will attain your heart's desire. Verse 
verse 131. Though the mind exists in Nirvikal Samadhi, that existence is actually Atman and there is no duality in it. Apart from the awareness of this and that, there is no mind. The concept of this and that is removed and the self alone exists. So what is happening in Nirvikalp Samadhi? Well, first you should understand what is Sarvikalp Samadhi. Sarvikalp Samadhi is when there is an object and the mind is so completely focused on this object that it seems to separate and the identification between consciousness or Atman and the mind increases until they become totally separate and Atman becomes the witness, witnesses the mind who has now become one with whatever object he is focusing on. So in this case, you saw that there was an object. But now imagine that the object drops away. But the mind is still, the mind itself now becomes the object and Atman is witnessing the mind itself. This is Nirvikalp Samadhi. The mind is there, but there's no more duality. There's no this and that. This concept has disappeared because the mind is no longer active. This is further explained in the verses 133 onwards. Confusion of seeing a snake and the rope happens on the basis of the rope, which is considered to be real. Therefore, consciousness illuminates the snake in a rope. This is referring to the famous traditional example given of somebody who walks in the dark. He sees a rope lying on the ground but thinks or imagines it's a snake. Why does he imagine it's a snake? For no reason? Well, there is. He imagines it's a snake because he has a fear of snakes. It's the fear of snake in him that's making him imagine that that rope is a snake. Instead of a, if instead of a snake, he could have imagined that it is a... It's somebody lying there, a person, just a person who is, you know, maybe it's a python kind of <laughs> snake and it could be a big person lying there. But no, you, you, you don't find that big fat rope to be a person. You think it's a big python. Why? Because you're not afraid of persons, people. You're afraid of snakes and pythons. So it's the fear which creates this snake or python. And the removal of this, what is this fear? The fear is the obstacle in your mind. It is, that's the coloring in your mind. The removal of it is important to remove that fear. When that fear disappears, it is knowledge. It's been illuminated and it's gone. The fear is gone. So removal of the snake and the rope is due to acknowledging the rope as such. When you see the rope, as a snake, that's not knowledge. But in the example of the dream, in which we see a rope, the rope exists in consciousness. When the dream is over, the rope disappears. Consciousness remains. Thus, not the objects of dreaming and waking, but consciousness alone is the self-existent reality. Then where does duality exist? So, we see in this example of the snake and the rope that the, if it were a dream, the rope would be also part of the consciousness. But when the dream is over, the rope disappears because it's part of the dream. But something remains and that's consciousness. So, I think this is a good place to stop here at verse 100 and 35, we continue next time and we 
with the most exciting chapters or the last chapters of the Tripura Ras here. And I hope you enjoyed it. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. See you next time.